Hey, what's going on guys? Ben Brewster here at TradeAthletics.com. Today we're going to talk about the nuts and bolts of effective throwing programs. Uh, so just kind of going over some considerations uh, as a coach or as an athlete in both constructing a throwing program and also what to look for uh, in your training program and what you're doing in the weight room and how those should kind of uh, merge together and, uh, and work in unison. So there are many ways of going forward, but only one way of standing still. Uh, I like this quote because essentially it shows that there's so many different ways to get to the top, so many different successful approaches, um, but there isn't really just one specific way. So I'm gonna be going over some general principles and uh, kind of what we've found and what we've learned, but it doesn't mean that this is the absolute, or it's the only way to construct a throwing program. So uh, if you looked at every single guy that just threw in the all-star game and looked at their routine you're going to find a lot of similarities but you're also going to find a lot of differences and so that's what we're going to be talking about here is kind of the difference uh, up front between principles and tools so a big mistake that a lot of coaches make is they think in terms of tools and not principles now what we've learned is that as coaches you actually need very few specific tools uh, but principles are really going to be the most important thing when designing any sort of program and actually be able to help athletes get better so if you can think in principles, then you can, as a coach, find the tool that fits the athlete's specific need. So an example here is with long toss, right? Some coaches use long toss uh, because they say, everyone should long toss, long toss is always great. I use long toss, uh, XYZ big league pitcher, he long tosses, therefore it must be great. Uh, that's an example of marrying yourself to one specific approach or one specific tool and not taking a principled approach. Now the flip side of that, if you think in terms of principles and then match the tool to the athlete, you could say, hey, this athlete could benefit from immediate feedback, uh, better direction, and increased intensity. Long toss trains those things, so we'll choose that tool for this specific athlete. If you understand why, uh, how certain tools work and the principles behind them, then you have a much better idea of how to match the specific tools to the specific scenario. Now, there's a problem, right? This sounds great in theory, but the problem is that this requires understanding of the principles and nuanced and critical thinking. So it's much harder to think this way. You need to have a much more in-depth uh, understanding and background in uh, you know, why all these different uh, factors exist to be able to think this way. But again, that is kind of the holy grail as a coach to be able to understand how these thousands of different tools all come together and how you can match the specific ones to the athlete's situation. So do we need XYZ drill to be effective? Do we need XYZ cue to be effective? Do we need any specific tool to get results with an athlete? Do we need wrist weights or weighted balls or Indian clubs or core velocity belt or a Mark Pro? Any of these tools that we've used before, if you told me I could never use any of those tools again, we would still be able to get athletes better because you understand the principles and the tools are just a means to getting to an end. So again, just to summarize, seek to understand what's actually holding the athlete back and then match the specific tools to the problem. Don't marry yourself to one approach. Don't be the kettlebell guy or the weighted ball guy or the core velocity belt guy. Be the results guy. Sometimes you're not gonna have the right tool to match the situation. Uh, whatever you're doing isn't gonna be working. And so sometimes as a coach, you're going to have to use your understanding and kind of come up with something new or a novel approach or perspective or variation on a drill or variation on a tool uh, to, to create the result. So again, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. So if what you're doing isn't working, you ultimately might have to be able to improvise and stray a little bit away from the, the beaten path and find a different way to get that athlete some results. So before we dive into kind of the nitty gritty uh, of, of throwing programming, uh, we first need to understand uh, kind of the, the macro view and, and how I kind of look at and conceptualize building out a program. So you need to be able to look, on, look at it on different time horizons, right? You need to be able to zoom all the way in to the individual throwing session uh, view, but you also need to be able to zoom out to it's called the microcycle view. This is typically gonna be like a week of training. You also need to be able to zoom out further and see how that relates to the mesocycle. How does that relate to their entire month of training? And then a macro cycle. So can you zoom out and actually see how all these months of training relate to the entire year of programming? Right, maybe an athlete comes to you in September. You need to be thinking about not just, you know, next spring, not just next summer, but next fall. You need to be thinking about how does all their throwing and training interrelate and thinking about that ahead of time not just winging it and only looking at the, the zoomed in individual session point of view. So in this way, it's kind of like layers of an onion. It's being able to look at the big picture and being able to kind of go through these different layers of the onion and see how all these pieces interrelate. So the way that we're gonna do this video is we're basically gonna bring up the different questions that you have to be able to answer when constructing a throwing program, or at least some of the questions, and then I'm gonna go through each of those questions one at a time and kind of give you my thoughts and give you some considerations. So macrocycle, again, that's the zoomed out view. That's the bird's eye view of their programming for the year. 
you gotta answer how will their throwing workload change over time? How will their training emphasis, so what they're doing in the weight room, again, I know that's not throwing, but how will that change over time? How will the volume and the intensity of what they're doing in the weight room change over time? You don't have to be an expert in constructing workouts, but you should have a general idea of how those things match up. Uh, what special events need to be programmed for? So understanding, hey, maybe this athlete has a scout day coming up on this day. Uh, maybe this high school athlete has a showcase coming up on this day. You need to be able to account for those events. And that can be peaking days, plan deloads, et cetera. So you need to account for, obviously, in season, early off season, late off season, preseason. How, is, how are things gonna change? How is the plan gonna change over time? These phases are obviously going to change based on the athlete's level. Now we zoom in a little bit to the mesocycle level. Again, this is uh, typically gonna be referring to a month of training, a month of throwing. So what's the focus? How will I lay out each individual monthly phase to accomplish these goals? Am I gonna do seven straight months of you know, pull downs, velo phases? Or am I gonna do command phase? Or am I gonna do in-season phases? Am I gonna work on pitch design emphasis? How am I gonna lay these out? And what's the, fo what's the focus gonna be? And how does that evolve over time? Zoom in a little bit more to microcycle, to the weekly layer of the onion. Uh, how will I lay out the week of throwing to accomplish these goals? Are they gonna be doing five velocity days a week? One, two, three uh, hybrid days, recovery days? How am I gonna lay that week out? And then zooming all the way into the individual sessions. How will I lay out the different components of a throwing session? Uh, what movement and mechanical flaws need to be addressed in their drill work and maybe their uh, pre-throwing routine and their post-throwing routine? How do I actually lay out the nuts and bolts on a daily basis? Again, you need to understand from an individual session standpoint, what are their strengths and weaknesses as a pitcher and how can I attack these? Now, this is the layer that everyone always thinks about. They think about the individual session layer, but again, I'm just saying you need to be able to take a step back and look at how that, uh, how that needs to evolve and change over time from this zoomed out perspective as well. Okay, so let's talk about how do throwing workloads change over time. Uh, just so some considerations in season, of course, uh, our throwing prescription has to be flexible in season. So it can't be this super rigid thing, especially for relievers, because again, they don't exactly know what their workload is gonna be week to week. In season, you're going to have higher in-game workloads. And so as a result, we're just simply not gonna be able to throw as much volume, as much intensity at these athletes because they're gonna be do getting their highest workloads of the entire year in season. And all those throws are gonna be happening in game. So as far as our prep throwing, our pregame throwing, we need to just be aware of that when designing, hey, plyo routine, drill routine, long toss routine. We just need to be aware of that and match a specific and appropriate prescription given what they're having to do in season. Uh, starters, it's gonna be a lot more predictable. Relievers, it's gonna be a lot less predictable. It's very, very easy to overdo it with relievers. Uh, we've learned that uh, it's just super common when you tell an athlete like, hey, we need to focus on intensity in these drills. They take their recovery days, they take their moderate effort days in season, and they're just blowing it out pregame. And then they're wondering why they threw three, day, three games that week and their arm is just completely blown up. Well, it's partly because they threw three games that week, but it's probably because they were throwing 90% effort pregame two or three days of the week as well. Early off season, uh, so this would be, you know, September through maybe mid-November for most college guys. Uh, again, this depends on if they're gonna be playing fall baseball or not playing fall baseball. If they're playing fall baseball, you're gonna have to treat it a little bit more like an in-season phase as far as what they're going to be able to tolerate. And if they're not playing fall ball, again, it's kind of fair game at that point. Once you on-ramp them, uh, you can focus a little bit more on whatever their lowest hanging fruit is. This is a great time to do general velo building phases, something like uh, pull downs might fit great here because you know that you're still gonna have plenty of time throughout the rest of the off season to translate that to the mound, translate that to a catcher with a hitter off dirt in cleats. And so this is a good time for that. But even still, it's worth noting, you should have planned deloads every four to eight weeks. So if you're gonna just go balls to the walls and do an entire off season of velocity training work, you just need to be aware that you can't go month after month after month after month and just keep hammering hard at it without ever taking a slight step back. Uh, that's something we've kind of learned the hard way over the years is even if an athlete feels great, you need to be willing to take a slight step back and come back fresher the following week. So we'll talk more about that in a second, but four to eight weeks, every four to eight weeks, at least taking a slightly less intense week, even if an athlete feels great. So if an athlete is playing fall ball, again, depending on the workload, depending on what they're having to do, uh, it's gonna dictate a lot about what you can do with, with the rest of the week. So maybe they're only throwing an inning on Saturdays. Well, you probably have a little more wiggle room to maybe do a high intensity bullpen on Tuesday or Wednesday and maybe push it a little bit more. But maybe they're throwing four innings on Saturdays or four innings on Fridays, or maybe it varies all the time, and they have no idea. You might have to treat them more like an in-season reliever in that case. Typically, we'll also do a short deload uh, following their fall season. 
Uh, so again, that typically is going to be uh, somewhere around mid-November. We'll talk more about that in a second. When it comes to late off-season, this is a time you can be fairly aggressive with your throwing and with your lifting phases because, again, a lot of, a lot of college guys are going to be home for, for winter break. They're going to be recovering well. They're not going to have a ton of stress. And so they're going to be able to handle fairly high intensity throwing and also moderate to high intensity lifting. So this is a time when you can really make good progress between about that November and January uh, time frame. This is, of course, still time to focus on the lowest hanging fruit. So, uh, for guys who really do need velocity and that, that really is their limiting factor, it's time to extend out and do additional velocity phases. If it's a guy who has already gained a ton of velocity but he needs to be able to harness that and actually throw that uh, you know, where he wants, or it's a guy who needs a third or a fourth pitch, then again, you need to shape the focus of this time extremely carefully and to what they need. Preseason, you have to shift to competition mode. You have to shift to execution mode. Uh, again, we've learned this the hard way. You, you gain velocity and you wanna just keep on going. Uh, maybe their season starts in six weeks, but you think you can squeeze out another mile an hour. It's easy to get greedy, but the problem is, and we've learned this the hard way, is that you put a lot of those gains uh, at risk if you try to just take a velocity phase right up until the start of the season because you don't give that athlete time to actually transition uh, what they're doing to the mound, transition it to more of an execution focus, uh, transition it from just throwing the ball as hard as they can to being able to locate that ball as hard as they can, locate that pitch. And so this becomes execution bullpens, uh, live at bats, building them up, adding those game-like variables one at a time so that we can see, maybe we have made a major adjustment to their patterns. We can see where that pattern might break down. So maybe they did pull downs and they gained 10 miles an hour pull downs. And we slowly transition them through November to the mound. And so now they're just throwing, you know, if they gain five miles an hour to a net off a mountain, that's great. Now we need to add a catcher. Now we need to add off-speed pitches. Now we need to add a stand-in hitter. Now we need to get them outside, do it off dirt, do it in cleats. Now we need to do it in a game situation where the catcher's calling pitches. So adding these variables one at a time, a lot of times you'll find a point where the pattern starts to break down and that's where you can kind of focus your time and your energy before you add more variables. But if you just go from pull downs or throwing, uh, throwing off the mound into a net in season, there's no shot. You're putting those gains at risk by not doing a preseason phase and not shifting to competition mode. From a training standpoint, this is again not a time to be a hero in the weight room. It's not a time to be hitting squat PRs, deadlift PRs, uh, you know, dumbbell bench press PRs. So just being aware, again, where the emphasis should be placed. This is, again, sounds like common sense, uh, but a lot of athletes will get super over aggressive. They had a great productive off season and they have trouble transitioning the focus to, hey, it's, this isn't just continuing to lift as hard as possible and throw as hard as possible. There's actually a season coming up. There's also a good time to shift to more of an in-season training mode. So more speed or more power oriented stuff. Again, even if strength is still a limiting factor for that, that athlete, you're gonna be trying to relatively minimize fatigue and maximize performance in this preseason period. So again, even if strength is a limiting factor for a lot of these guys, we'll still transition them to more of a power emphasis, maybe somewhere between 40 to 60 or 40 to 70% of the one rep max. When it comes to deloads and peaking, we do need to have an awareness of what they have, what their entire year looks like, and when these specific relevant dates occur so that we can build those in and build the program around those. So let's first talk about planned rest periods. So first we talked about uh, plan deloads. We've learned to really not push beyond about four to eight weeks without a deload in throwing. So this depends on how aggressive you're going to be in your throwing. So if an athlete is going to be doing high intensity twice per week, typically every four weeks doing a brief deload is, is warranted. But maybe they're only doing one high intensity day per week and one 80-85% bullpen or pull downs or whatever per week that might be a guy who can get away with six to eight weeks before doing a planned deload. But we've learned not to just completely get away from doing planned deloads and not waiting until the athlete has something break or until the arms, their arm's killing them. To plan those in, it massively reduces the number of incidents we have where athletes come to us and say, my arm's completely hanging, I just, I need a day off, I feel like total, total crap. Um, that is extremely important, is being able to plan in those deloads from that bird's eye view. As far as planning total time off from throwing, uh, we, again, there's a little bit of controversy in terms of exactly how much time an athlete should take off from throwing. I don't think there's a magic number because it, again, depends on the athlete, their specific situation. Are they a senior in college whose their baseball career is about to be over if they don't gain five miles an hour? Or are they a 14 year old kid who's got you know, his entire high school career ahead of him? You're probably gonna wanna take different amounts of time off depending on the different situations. But as a general rule of thumb, we like to aim for about four weeks of total time 
completely off from throwing a year. And again, four weeks to gradually ramp up. So this is over eight weeks of time away from max effort throwing a year. Uh, that tends to be the minimum that we'll take off. And again, we'll take off more in certain situations. If an athlete threw a ton that year, and again, pitchability or velocity is not their issue, and it's really the ability to stay healthy, uh, and they had a high workload, maybe we'll give them a little bit more time off. But if it's a guy who's, again, at those specific inflection points in his career where he needs to start getting after it, uh, we're probably gonna err more on the side of kind of that minimum time off, minimum time required, especially if he didn't throw a ton that year, especially if his arm's feeling great. And again, you're gonna know if the athlete needs a deload. He's gonna tell you his arm's beat up. He's gonna tell you shoulders sore. He's gonna tell you he feels fatigued all the time. He just always feels tired. Um, you're gonna get these signals from the athlete, assuming that you have that, that open communication with them, uh, that they need a deload. Even if you don't have that open communication, if you're tracking their velocity numbers on a weekly basis, you're gonna see those numbers plateau hard or even decrease and, and drop off pretty hard. And so again, those are all indications that an athlete needs a deload. A deload taking five to seven days of, of lower intensity isn't, doesn't mean that the athlete's getting weaker and getting worse. In fact, they typically come back and if they don't set a PR the next week, their numbers typically rebound very strongly. So that's actually a time you're recovering and you're getting stronger. And so communicating that to an athlete that you're not getting worse by giving yourself time to rest. Planned peaking periods, again, self-explanatory, but uh, you wanna make sure you can maximize performance in these key events, in these uh, showcases or scout days or tryouts for a free agent. And so having an awareness of where these occur, being able to dial down the volume, be able to dial down the throwing workload a little bit preceding these events, again, extremely important to know ahead of time. So now we'll talk a little bit about training emphasis. So what's happening in the weight room? Again, it's important to know, even as a pitching coach, it's important to know what the athlete's doing in the weight room, even if you're not the one actually writing out and designing the workouts or taking them through the workouts. It's important to at least have that bird's eye view of, hey, what's the focus this month? Are you guys working on strength? Is it super high volume? Is it power? Is it speed? Are they gonna be super fatigued when they get, get to me in practice? It's important to have an understanding of how these things coincide. So what the athlete should be focusing on does depend on the, both the time of year and also what their lowest hanging fruit is from a physical capacity standpoint. So when it comes to the off season, it's really all of these things are fair game. Hypertrophy, so working on size, strength, uh, speed or power, these are all fair game and it depends on what the athlete needs. Typically we are going to be focusing more on hypertrophy and strength for an undersized athlete who has not hit our strength thresholds. Uh, I'll post a link to our metric analysis tool if you guys want to learn more about those strength thresholds and what we typically target. But essentially we're targeting, hey, if you look at a strong big league pitcher, what are some of the numbers they can hit from a strength standpoint? And we've kind of outlined what those typically look like and that's what we shoot for with our college and our high school guys. And it's actually not as difficult to hit as a lot of you guys might think. Uh, it is an advanced strength base, but it's not power lifter strong. So once they build that strength base, we do tend to focus more on speed and power with our guys. In season, you're not gonna be able to handle super high volume uh, workloads in the weight room. So in season, hypertrophy is off the table. Uh, strength is off the table for more advanced athletes. Uh, you're typically at most gonna be wanting to do a couple heavy sets uh, on a movement in a workout. You really don't wanna be overly fatigued in season or overly sore. So in season, the focus becomes more maintenance or speed and power development. Now our thinking has evolved a little bit on this over time where it used to be, hey, just do your strength block, but cut the volume in half. So still hit it hard, but do very, very low volume, cut the number of sets in half and you're gonna maintain your strength and you're not gonna be sore. And so that works fine to maintain performance and not be sore, but can we maintain performance, not be sore and actually improve upon something? And so shifting the focus to a very, very slight amount of strength work, but still getting after it on speed and power movements, you can still get that neurological stimulus in season without being, again, sore or fatigued. So we've shifted it more to speed and power, again, regardless of if a kid still needs to gain 20 pounds, uh, regardless of if he's a pro guy, a college guy, we're still tending to, to try to work on imp actually improving something in season versus just accepting that, hey, we're just gonna stay the same and, and maintain. The one exception to this might be young novice athletes who just started training within the past year or two. Uh, they may still be able to tolerate strength training in season. So maybe you have a 15-year-old kid who's a starting pitcher, he throws four innings on the weekend. You can probably get after it on Tuesday knowing that he's gonna be fully recovered by Saturday. Okay, now we can zoom in a little bit to the microcycle and the mesocycle level. So again, what are we doing on a monthly basis and what are we doing on a weekly basis? So one of the key concepts here is to focus on 
one or two qualities in your throwing and your training programs. So this would be known as block periodization, but it basically means, hey, we have four weeks to work on something. What are we working on? You should be able to answer that question. It shouldn't be 12 different answers. So it shouldn't be we're working on strength and hypertrophy and speed and power and velocity and command. You can try to do that, but you're not gonna optimize the actual quality that you're working on. So it, having a focus for each specific month, both in the weight room and in throwing, uh, you can call it block periodization for a fancy term, but it's, again, it's just having a specific focus so that the athlete not only physiologically can they adapt to that one, uh, that one stimulus, but also just have a, have a direction to what they're doing and, and just have, a, have more intent uh, behind, as far as focus, behind what they're doing in every throw that they make. Uh, in the weight room, uh, you can also choose between two, three, and four day training splits. So uh, understanding like how, how many times a week should I be training? Again, this is important to understand just to make sure that your athletes aren't coming to you super fatigued and you have no idea why. You need to understand bare minimum the overall intensity and, and workload that they're handling in the weight room. So in the off season, three to four days a week typically is ideal. In season, we found that two to three days is typically ideal as far as frequency of training. So what they're doing in the weight room. Four days a week tends to be overkill in season. And even three days a week, it can be too much, especially if their volume uh, within those workouts is too high. As far as throwing frequency, so how many days a week we're throwing, uh, typically we found that four to six days a week of throwing is kind of the sweet spot. But really the most important variable is how many days of high intensity throwing are they doing? You can get away with throwing recovery days every single day forever, right? You can get away with that. You can recover easily by the next day. It's the high intensity day that, that needs to be perfectly and carefully planned. And so we found again, one to two high intensity throwing days per week is typically the sweet spot. Two is gonna be more aggressive. This works fairly well for lower velocity guys. So someone throwing 75 miles an hour, they're not doing as much damage to their tissues. It's not as neurologically taxing. And so they might be able to recover within a day or two from a high intensity session. Whereas somebody who's already more advanced is not gonna be able to recover as quickly and as readily. And so that's where the option of one high intensity throwing day actually works very well. And so we have to get guys away sometimes uh, from this, this attitude that more is always better, higher intensity is always better, and that's the only way to gain velocity. There's this thought in the baseball world that intensity is the only way to drive velocity gains, that you just need to adapt your arm to higher intensity, adapt your arm to higher workloads. It really doesn't work that way. It works that way to a point, and that's what the on-ramping phase is for. But if it worked that way, you'd eventually see pitchers throwing 300 pitches in their starts. They just keep building, uh, keep adapting until they can handle these high workloads. Their arm would just keep getting stronger if that was how it worked, and they would just eventually throw 110 miles an hour. There's eventually a point where you need to structure and periodize this effectively and understand there are limits to how much you can push intensity and workload. And so we found, for especially for pro guys and higher velocity guys, that one high intensity day a week typically is more conservative. They can sustain that for longer before they need to deload. They can still make improvements in velocity because we're working on now efficiency in their second bullpen a week. That second bullpen becomes maybe an 80 to 85 to 90 percent day, and a lot of times we'll use that to work on whatever uh, whatever they're lacking mechanically. So we can still work on mechanical efficiency, and again, mechanical efficiency is really the, the hack to improving velocity uh, because you don't need to constantly push intensity. And it's also a more conservative way to do so. When you improve mechanical efficiency, you not only improve their peak velocity, but you also improve average velocity. It becomes easier to maintain that start to start, outing to outing, and then again, deep into outings as well. We zoom into the individual session layer of that onion. Now we're, now we're starting to get into familiar territory uh, when most people think of throwing programming. We're talking about things like drill selection and variance. Uh, one thing that I like to tell our coaches is how you actually cue and coach a drill is way more important than selecting the right drill. Uh, there's really not a, a right drill for a specific athlete. Um, you might give something like a rocker drill to two separate guys and one guy is able to, you know, able to rotate effectively out of the backside, block the front leg, the arms up on time, and it ends up being a great drill for him. And the other guy, he takes the exact same drill, the exact same cues, and his, he just totally butchers it. He extends off the back leg, he's got a soft front leg, the, the elbow pushes out in front of the plane of rotation. And so you need to be able to adapt and coach different drills depending on how the athlete actually interprets those drills. So yes, it's important to select drills that seem to, you have to have hypothesis and select drills that correspond to the, that athlete's weaknesses, but you also need to observe and, and adapt and see what's working and see what's not and being able to intervene and modify the drill or modify the cues or modify how you coach it or position the athlete to be able to get the most out of those drills. 
probably 20% of it is actually selecting the list of drills. Probably 80% of it is how you coach the athlete through those drills. Uh, another, another key component and variable that a lot of coaches don't necessarily think about is plyo and long toss preferences. So most coaches are either pro long toss or anti long toss. They're pro plyo curve balls while they're anti plyo curve balls. Their entire staff does, does it or they don't do it. Uh, and I'm suggesting that you need to be a little bit more nuanced with how you program these things. So observe how the athlete responds to certain plyo curve drills. Is it helping their patterns or is it hurting their patterns? If there's a consistent trend of it's hurting their patterns and you can't remedy the situation, maybe you need to ditch plyos. We see that with a good percentage of our guys and so we don't use plyos with every guy. Same thing goes for long toss. Long toss is a phenomenal drill. We think of it as a drill. I'll link a video up here if you guys wanna learn more about my thoughts about long toss. But we don't use long toss for every guy because we observe how it actually is influencing their patterns, how it's influencing their results on the mound, and it doesn't always work for everybody. Having these different preferences, maybe you have a guy with a super low elbow, you have a low slot guy, and you realize that long toss just gets him more uphill, it gets his elbow lower, it gets him more underneath the ball, and that when we get away from long toss and we get him down on the line, his velocity numbers creep up, his ability to get on top of the ball for his off-speed pitches improves, and so again, understanding some of these key variables is really helpful from an individual session standpoint. Pre and post throwing routines. One of the things that we, we've added to our pre-throwing routines uh, since a couple of years ago is a specific feels drill routine. So if they have a specific movement flaw that they're really working hard on, a lot of times they're gonna be limited by how many actual physical throws they can do each day. Whereas a hitter might be able to do 300 plus swings a day, you might only have 50 or 60 or 80 throws a day that you can, you can actually do. We know that when it comes to patterning, uh, high frequency, high repetition, uh, provided you can do good repetitions, is, is one of the more important variables. So the fields drills is just a way to emphasize whatever piece of the delivery we're trying to focus on and build that into their warm-up, build that into their pre-throwing routine. We can't possibly cover all this information in this video, but from an individual session standpoint, from how to construct a drill routine, we go into this in a ton of detail in our free four-week throwing routine. Uh, I'll link down below so you guys can check that out. I would highly encourage you to read through that. It's 70 plus pages of, of good content. We go through each drill and exactly why you might, might or might not want to choose that specific drill and again, how to build and construct an entire drill routine. And finally, I wanna leave you guys with some additional, additional tips that didn't necessarily fit in those previous categories. Uh, one is don't be afraid to improvise if something isn't working. Uh, we already touched on this, but uh, if it's not working, insanity is the definition of doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. So sometimes you have to stray away from the plan, and that's actually a sign of a good coach, is knowing when to stray away from the plan when an athlete does plateau. Flat grounds versus mound work. Something we've observed is once an athlete has been on-ramped to the mound and now their delivery is synced up on the mound, it's synced up downhill and everything's on time, incorporating flat grounds can actually give the body some uncertainty in, in the repeatability of their patterns. And so we've seen that if an athlete's ramped up to the mound, their patterns are in sync on the mound, and then you still have them doing a couple of flat grounds a week, their body doesn't really know like when to be ready for the foot to land. And so this can create some inconsistencies. What we found is that once you've built up to the mound, if you want to get additional work, additional reps to a catcher, just do a short bullpen. Just do a short box, 55 feet, 70, 75% intensity, and do it off a mound. And it gives the body, again, this one consistent signal. This is especially important in season just to avoid developing any sort of timing or any sort of uh, you know, synchronization issues. Plows versus weighted balls versus five ounce only. Again, we kind of talked about this already, but not marrying yourself to any one specific tool. If plows aren't working for the guy, you can try throwing weighted balls with the exact same drill work to a catch play partner. If that's not working, you can also just throw, just throw baseballs. Before weighted balls were popular, it doesn't mean that guys weren't still able to get better. I didn't really throw weighted balls at all in college and I gained 10 miles an hour. So a big piece of that is, can we improve patterns? Can we improve your mechanical efficiency? That's a reason that plyo balls and weighted balls work, is they actually help you improve your efficiency by giving you these varying weights. It doesn't mean you can't still improve efficiency with a five ounce ball. So just understanding these are all tools that have their place, but not marrying yourself to any one specific tool. When it comes to plyos or drill work in general, whether you're doing that drill work with plyos or weighted balls or just with a baseball, understanding the point of the drill work. The point of the drill work is in most cases not actually to push intensity, it's to push efficiency, it's to push efficiency and smoothness of the patterns. Uh, I'll link a video here of Graham talking about how he's able to continue to increase velocity year over year. But one of the key takeaways is efficiency. It's how smooth can I be every single throw? And so 
that's really the focus of this drill work, is how efficient can I be in this drill work? It's not about trying to throw at max effort every single rep, or you just burn yourself out. Another issue you guys are typically gonna run into that you need to be aware of as a coach is the role of recovery days. Uh, again, guys think that recovery days mean 80% and they think that moderate day means 95% and they think that a velocity day means 120%. Really understanding like a recovery day is a day to take your arm for a walk. It's a day to just move through the range of motion and allow that arm to recover and reframing it for guys that are just chronically overworking themselves because they don't understand how you, for every high intensity day, you need a recovery day that kind of balances that out. Throwing to a person, uh, I talked about this before, I'll link another video discussing long tossing into a net versus actually long tossing outdoors to a person. This is extremely important and overlooked. And I know as the rise of, of plyo curve balls uh, has gotten more popular, people have kind of gotten away and uh, start to think that, hey, all I need is to throw this ball, these different colored balls into a net and, and I'll be fine. But it's really easy to start to uh, unknowingly have your patterns deteriorate on you or build up a bad habit and you don't know because you didn't see the flight of the ball. You, you didn't have a partner to tell you, hey, that ball cut, that ball was eight feet arm side. You really can't tell. So throwing to a person is an extremely invaluable way to let's take what you're doing in your drill work and now let's attempt to transfer that to catch play on a daily basis. So it's very infrequent that we'll completely take catch play out of the equation or long toss or bullpens or any sort of throwing to an actual person with a baseball that we totally take that out of the equation. Uh, if you just throw plyos for three straight months and then you pick up a baseball, it may work, but a lot of times there will be some crazy bad habit that was formed because they weren't doing that and also consistently working on transferring it to a partner. Uh, less is more, so simplify over time. So especially early on in programming for an athlete, you might have to test a lot of stuff. You might have to throw six, seven, eight drills at them and see what works and see what doesn't. But over time, as you begin to figure out what works and what doesn't, those pieces become anchors in the program. And so there's a lot less moving parts. You're basically just gonna be tinkering and experimenting on the fringes at that point, instead of changing the core routine that you found that works. So over time, maybe a guy only has the two or three drills that work for them and that's all they do. Maybe they don't need a ton of fields drills. Some of these things end up being training wheels that they need initially and you can kind of simplify it and bring it down to the core components that they actually need over time. So just understanding that it doesn't always need to be making things more complex. Uh, a lot of big league pitchers, they have their routine that works for them and they're really very rarely changing things. They might be changing little things on the fringes, but they don't get to that point and that consistency and that repeatability by changing things all the time. So to end this video, let's practice. Let's go through a little scenario and I'll just kind of show you just higher level, you know, kind of some observations. Uh, what I would be thinking if you, if you gave me these bullet points and said, like, what are considerations you would have in designing a program? So let's say we've got a pro pitcher. You notice in his assessment, he's got a low elbow. He's coming out of the hinge early. Some of his failed assessments, he failed the uh, lat tissue quality assessment. So he's got really gritty, tight, toned up uh, lat on his throwing side. He's limited in his overhead shoulder flexion. So he can't get overhead cleanly. He failed a lateral lunge test, so he can't cleanly get into hip abduction and open up that groin. Uh, you notice on his, on his plyo curve throws, he's cutting and yanking the crap out of those plyo curve balls, and that's carrying over to his actual catch play. He's cutting the ball. Uh, he likes weighted balls. His organization's okay with them. He's fresh off the end of the season, so you start coaching him mid-September. He wants to gain two miles an hour and develop a third pitch. Let's say he's 6'2", 200 pounds. He meets all the strength thresholds but his power numbers are a little subpar. Not exactly where you'd want to see them for a pro pitcher. So when I look at this, like what are some things that I would initially see? Well, first off, he's a pro pitcher. So we know we're gonna be a little bit more conservative with these guys. Typically your higher velocity guys, um, the more advanced that the athlete is, the more likely that any change you make is going to be detrimental. So we're gonna be kind of tiptoeing into some of these changes, not just trying to scrap everything that they've ever done. So that's just off the bat, something we're gonna be trying to figure out, what are you doing that's worked? What have you done in the past that hasn't worked? What is, what is injury history? And really listening to them and taking into consideration what has worked, trying not to completely overhaul everything, uh, especially if they've had success. Low elbow, so low elbow and, and with coming out of the hinge early. When we look at a movement flaw, we, we need to uh, understand it from multiple perspectives so we understand what's the cause of that flaw. So for both, both flaws, there could be a physical limitation contributing to that flaw. So for a low elbow, a common one that we see is an overactive lat. If we look at an assessment, we can see he's got a lat tissue quality problem and he can't get overhead. So those are both pieces of evidence pointing to he probably has an overactive lat that isn't allowing him to actually 
allow that elbow to get up and in plane. So he's driving down, over contracting the lat, and the elbow's out of plane. So again, there might be a physical limitation, but there might also be a motor patterning limitation as well. It could be both. So we might address it from a mobility standpoint, but we might also address it in terms of, of drill work. We might give him a lasso drill and say, hey, we need to have you understand what it feels like to get that elbow up in line with the shoulders in plane and go into relaxed layback. So we wanna be able to address these problems from multiple, uh, multiple perspectives, but ultimately understand what is the fundamental cause of each movement flaw. If we look at coming out of the hinge early, Again, from a mechanical standpoint, we might give them something like a step back or a hinge drill or kettlebell feels drill or something to feel moving forward while staying back and actually getting into his glute, holding a stable back foot, holding that stack position. We might give him that, but he might be limited by a super tight groin and an inability to actually stabilize his pelvis. We see that with the failed lateral lunge test. Just pointing towards these things interrelate, and if you can understand how to take an athlete through an assessment, understand what his body is capable of doing, now you have a strategy for understanding what's holding them back from a movement standpoint. Uh, you notice he cuts and yanks plyo. So again, understanding why is that happening? Is it happening because he thinks he needs to hit the target on the wall right in front of his face? And that's a simple fix. You back him up from the wall and explain that ball needs to actually hit arm side, not right in front of your face. Or is it something that you've already tried to address that and it's still happening, you backed him up from the wall and hey, we might just need to scrap plyo care balls. So trying to, trying to dig a little bit deeper, you're basically a detective trying to figure out exactly why everything's going on. Uh, you know he likes weighted balls, so that's not necessarily a concern. If that ends up being the right tool for the job, we're gonna use weighted balls. Uh, he's fresh off the end of the season, mid-September. Right off the bat, we're trying to figure out, hey, when does spring training start? How much did you throw this year? How much time off do we need to take? Typically, we might take off from mid-September to mid-October, take a full month on-ramp from mid-October to mid-November. And then from there, again, focusing on whatever his lowest hanging fruit is. In his case, he wants to gain two miles an hour and develop a third pitch. Here's where we really need to, we really need to understand the hierarchy of what's more important to his career. So if he's a guy throwing 91, he already has you know, two plus pitches, but he, if he's throwing 93, he's gonna be a big leaguer. That's probably more important. That's probably more important than adding a third pitch, but he might be the opposite. He might be a guy already throwing 98. He wants to throw 100, but he's already throwing 98. And if he gets, if he develops that third pitch, he's a big leaguer or he's a more successful big leaguer. So understanding the hierarchy, we can kind of focus on both at once, but we still need to know which to prioritize in terms of building out their throwing emphasis. And then from his training standpoint, again, even if you're not handling their workouts, you're not writing their workouts or coaching them through, uh, understanding, hey, this guy already meets our requisite strength thresholds. He's already a strong guy. You're probably not gonna spend most of the year in a strength phase. You're probably gonna spend more of that year in a power or speed phase because that's where he's lacking. Still, one consideration for guys like this, for advanced guys, is you probably don't wanna go the entire year not ever focusing on strength a single time. So if 12 months of training, you probably don't wanna have zero focusing on strength. So a lot of times we'll focus on strength for one block, and that block typically works best as their, uh, as their time off from throwing or the first block of the off season. So maybe we have them in a strength block from mid-September to mid-October, then we transition to power for most of the off season. Then we transition for speed as kind of a peaking phase pre-spring training. Again, that's just me thinking through a, a little scenario uh, with some hypotheticals. But you can start to see how all these things begin to interact and how if you can look at it from kind of this bird's eye view, you can start to put the puzzle pieces in place. That's our approach. That's what we take uh, with our tread athletes, uh, with our remote guys. We try to understand the problems that they're facing. We try to understand their bodies. And then we try to put the puzzle pieces in place. Hopefully you guys found some value in this video. If you liked the video, give it a thumbs up, give it a like, comment down below if you have any questions. And as always, you guys are more than welcome to email us at contact at .com. We read every email, we try to be helpful, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. See you guys in the next video.